Imagine, just imagine facing execution, knowing in your heart you're innocent, the clock ticking down to your very last hours. It's a horrifying thought, and that's the stark reality for Robert Leslie Robertson III in Texas right now. And that's what we're diving deep into today. A story straight from the headlines, a true race against time. And what makes this case, the Robertson case, so deeply unsettling, so significant, is that it hinges on what's known as shaken baby syndrome, or SBS. And the science, well, it's become incredibly controversial, even among those who support the death penalty. So before we unpack all of that, let's uh, make sure we're all on the same page, the basics. Robert Robertson III, he's facing execution this week in Texas. This goes back to 2002, the death of his two-year-old daughter. Right, and he was convicted of murder, but here's the thing. He's always maintained he's innocent. His stance is his daughter's death. It wasn't murder. It was due to complications from pneumonia. And this is where it gets really complicated because we're talking about shaken baby syndrome. It's not exactly a straightforward diagnosis, is it? You're right. It's incredibly complex. I mean, for years, SBS, it was seen as a fairly clear-cut diagnosis. Doctors, they were trained to look for a specific pattern of injuries in infants, things like bleeding in the brain, retinal hemorrhages, and that was it. Violent shaking, case closed. And while that might seem to make sense on the surface, you said for years, as if things have changed. They have, and this is crucial. There's a growing debate, a real questioning of the science behind SBS. More and more experts are suggesting that, well, those theories, the ones often blamed on shaking, they could actually be caused by other things, things like certain medical conditions that, well, they mimic the symptoms of SBS. So we could be talking about misdiagnosing something very, very serious with unimaginable consequences. Absolutely. And tragically, this debate, this questioning of SBS, it's already led to overturned convictions. Which brings us back to Robert Robertson III and why his case is attracting so much attention. Because now, it's not just about one man's guilt or innocence. Exactly. It becomes a much bigger conversation, a conversation about the death penalty itself, <laughs> about how our understanding of medical evidence is always evolving, and most importantly, about the very real possibility that we could be making a horrifying mistake. And speaking of a race against time, just hours before the scheduled execution, a Texas judge issued a temporary restraining order, essentially putting everything on hold. Yeah, some Texas House members, they felt strongly that um, Robertson, he should have a chance, you know, to actually testify, to speak at a legislative hearing about SBS. And it seems the judge, well, the judge agreed, at least for now. Wow, that is, that's a huge turn of events. But of course, it's never simple, is it? I mean, we've got the Texas Attorney General's office. They're ready to appeal that ruling. And if that wasn't enough, the Supreme Court, they just issued a decision, too. Yeah. So for those of us who, you know, who don't spend all our time in courtrooms, what does this back and forth actually mean? What did the Supreme Court say? Okay, so the appeals process, it's basically, um, it's a way for legal decisions to get reviewed by higher courts. So in this case, the Texas Attorney General, they're trying to, well, to overturn the judge's restraining order to get things moving again. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court, they've allowed the execution to go ahead. But there might be a glimmer of hope here. Just as Sonia Sotomayor, she issued a statement. And in it, she urged Texas Governor Greg Abbott to, to grant what's called a 30-day reprieve. Mm -hmm. That would give the Texas Board of Pardons and Proles more time, you know, to really look at the evidence again, consider everything we're talking about. You mentioned the Board of Pardons and Paroles. Could you, um, for those who aren't legal experts, just quickly explain what their role is in all this? Sure. They basically act as um, kind of a safety valve in the justice system, I guess you could say. They have the power to recommend clemency to the governor. Things like pardons, sentence commutations, especially in cases like this, you know, where there are serious questions about the evidence. So a slim chance, but a chance. And this is what makes the doubts about this case so important. We're not just talking about Robert Robertson claiming innocence. This is about people who were originally involved in the case, who have now completely changed their minds. It's true, and it's pretty extraordinary. The lead detective, the one who actually investigated the case, Brian Wharton, he's now publicly stated that he believes Robert Robertson is innocent, that the child's death, it wasn't abuse, it was likely due to medical complications. Wow, that is, that's a complete reversal. What caused such a dramatic shift in his thinking? Detective Wharton's been very open about it, actually. He says that going back over the evidence, thinking about this case over the years, he's just, he's no longer convinced that shaking was the cause of death. He's actually become a pretty vocal advocate for commuting Robertson's sentence. He's even gone on record saying, and I quote, he's an innocent man and we're very close to killing him for something he did not do. 
That's a, well, that's a powerful statement coming from someone who, as you said, was initially at responsible for putting Robertson behind bars. But it doesn't end there. We also have other medical experts, right? Experts who've looked over the case files and, and reached a different conclusion. We do. Several medical professionals have suggested that pneumonia, which Robertson did claim his daughter had in the days before her death, that it could have been a significant factor, maybe even the primary cause of death. And this is where the idea of a misdiagnosis becomes just, well, terrifying, really. It makes you think a misdiagnosis. That could be the difference between life and death for someone like Robert Robertson. It makes you question everything. It does. Because if there were other medical factors, like these experts are suggesting, it throws that whole SBS diagnosis into question, right? I mean, it just highlights how what we might have considered settled science, it can be reinterpreted, reevaluated as, you know, our medical knowledge, our diagnostic techniques advance. And it gets even more complicated. We found out that Robert Robertson, he was diagnosed with autism. This was after his conviction. How does this new information play into everything else? Well, his lawyers are arguing that his autism, it might have been misinterpreted, especially his behavior, his demeanor after his daughter's death. You see, in the original trial, prosecutors, they pointed to what they saw as a lack of emotion, a lack of outward grief as evidence of his guilt. Sadly, this is, this is a tragically common and very flawed argument that we see pop up in these cases of miscarriage of justice. It's, it's heartbreaking to think about that all these factors, misinterpreted medical evidence, potential bias against someone because they're on the autism spectrum, and this lack of understanding about how individuals with autism process, how they express their emotions, that these things could play a role in a wrongful conviction. It's, it's deeply unsettling. And as you said, these are, these are sadly common threads in cases where, where people are later exonerated. You're absolutely right. In this case, it just it shines a light on the flaws that still exist within our justice system and the urgent, the desperate need for reform. It's, it's almost impossible to wrap our heads around this. You know, as we're sitting here talking about this, Robert Robertson, he's still on death row. He could be executed within days. It's it's that fear that we could be making this this irreversible mistake. It's a heavyweight for sure. The death penalty, it's it's final. There's no coming back from that. And it just, it forces us to really grapple with these two incredibly important values, you know, mm -hmm. our desire for justice, but also our commitment to, to not causing irreparable harm. And it makes you wonder, even if, even if the courts decide to go ahead with it, if all the appeals fail, will we ever, will we ever really know for sure if Robert Robertson was guilty? Or will there always be that doubt, that, that question of, did we execute an innocent man? That's, that's the impossible thing about this case, right? Because even if even if down the line more evidence comes out, even if his name is cleared, you can't you can't undo an execution. And that's that's a haunting thought. It should it should give everyone pause. You know, this case, it's touched so many people, even people who, you know, maybe don't normally question the death penalty because of that fear, because it's it's that possibility that that we could be on the verge of taking a life unjustly. And it forces us to to confront some really uncriftable truths about our justice system, about the very real possibility that, that we're getting it wrong, sometimes in the most horrific ways imaginable. And that's why cases like Robert Robertson's, they're so important. They show us the limits of what we know, right. you know, and, and the, what we believe to be true today, what we're using to make these, these life and death decisions, it could be proven wrong tomorrow. I mean, history is sadly full of these cases where people were convicted, even sentenced to death, based on, well, what turned out to be flawed science or incomplete information. It makes you ask, what if? What if Robert Robertson is executed and then later down the line exonerated, like, like we've seen happen again and again throughout history? What does that say about us, about our justice system? That's, that's a question that, that we should all be asking ourselves. You know, it's, mm -hmm. It makes us look at our values and ask, are we, are we willing to risk that irreversible harm even when, like with SBS, the science, it's still evolving. It's not clear cut. This this goes beyond politics, beyond personal beliefs. This is about about the sanctity of human life. And it reminds us that we that we can't afford to be complacent. We need a system that's willing to to adapt, to evolve, because our understanding of science, of medicine, of of human behavior, it's constantly growing and changing. Absolutely. We can't just rest on past decisions when there's when there's new information that challenges everything we thought we knew about a case. We owe it to ourselves, to to everyone, to make sure that we're not that we're not condemning people to death based on, you know, outdated science or implicit biases or, or incomplete information. 
this case, it's far from over, and it raises some some really profound questions, questions about science, about justice, about whether we're right now on the verge of making an irreversible mistake. And as the story continues to unfold, we just we want to leave you with this. What will you be thinking about? How does this case, how does it make you see justice, especially in the face of science that's constantly changing? 